Good afternoon to one and all our esteemed guests from academia and industry, both in India and abroad. Distinguished members of the Association of Indian Management Schools, members of the governing body, respected director Bhatia Vidya Bhavan, Kolkata Kendra, the principal Bhatia Vidya Bhavan Institute of Management Science, Kolkata, the workmate fraternity and all our dear students. On behalf of the Association of Indian Management Schools, Bhatia Vidya Bhavan Institute of Management Science, and my behalf, I, Swati Basu, working in the capacity of an assistant professor in the Department of English Language Studies at the outset, respectfully welcome and thank each of you for accepting the invitation and gracing this occasion. We welcome all our honored guests for making their vital presence this afternoon at the International Speaking Engagement on Industry 4.0, the role of academia. Moving on, we stand at the defining moment, that of the auspicious ceremony to light the lamp as part of our traditional culture, to lead us from the darkness to light, and thus inaugurate the session. With this, may I request Joshi Ji and Professor Bishurup Chatterjee to take us through the divine moment of lighting the lamp. <laughs> As the mood shifts to optimism, let us seize this opportunity in generating new ideas by the address of the esteemed speakers on the diversified issues of concern to partake in the global growth. May I now request Dr. G.V. Subramanian, the director, Bhatia Vidya Bhavan Kolkata Kendra, to mark his inaugural address. Sir, over to you. So kindly unmute yourself, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, it's wonderful to have every one of you over here, both from the industry and from the academia. And I'm very happy that AIMS has chosen PAMS as a partner to organize this particular seminar or webinar, what we call it as. And I welcome every participant to this webinar, Industry 4.0, The Role of Academia a wonderful present topic, which is very much required, a lot of deliberations and action. In the, whatever the industry requirement, the academia is used to do it, but industry has gone uh, a lot of changes at this particular point of time. So every academic institution is very much required to tune itself to the requirement of the industry, meaning, <clears throat> Every, in, every uh, institution should go beyond the syllabus, teach the students, increase their skills, hone their skills, and then give them a lot of opportunities to increase their creativity, to increase their understanding, to increase their research sk skills, increase their communication skills, everything by which the student becomes a complete prepared person for the industry. On olden days, so people were recruited into industry and industry had a separate training and development department where the newly recruited person is completely trained and developed and later on he is recruited. Those days are gone now. Now industry is looking for a finished product and that finished product is to be made by the academia. That is a role of academia, academical institutions which have to provide that kind of a student who will be absorbed in the industry. And as per the requirement, as per the changes, as per the transformation which is taking place in industry, the academic institution should also gear up for such kind of a transformation. 
and we are going to have so wonderful deliberations on these lines and on many other issues the uh, regarding the industry 4.0 and the role of academia which is the topic of the webinar and i hope to hear many things and learn many things from the very good speakers who have come forward once again on behalf of ams and our bams bounds institute of management studies i welcome one and all of you for this webinar thank you thank you sir <clears throat> sri m venkatesh valus has been the executive secretary of aims for over 11 years earlier he worked with the administrative staff college of india for about 40 years in various positions and retired as its assistant registrar heading both establishment and secretariat before joining ascii he served in a court of law and industry for over 5 years let me now request mr m venkateshwaru the executive secretary secretary of the association of indian management schools to take us to the goals of association of indian management schools thank you sir over to you <clears throat> namaste to all of you just a few words general introduction kind of a thing the association of indian management schools shortly am it is a 32 year old non profit society it was founded with the purpose of professionalization of management education in india it's an independent networking body that is an umbrella body of nearly 800 b schools it's one of the largest networks of b schools in the world aims has many top class institutions and management departments of university as its members it is official representative of indian management school in india as well as in some important international <coughs> forums like md sir aacsb acbsp efmd and a few others through its multifarious activities aims made a great impact on institution faculty and student for the past three decades the president of aims is an ex officio representative on the aacit board of management studies that deliberates and makes recommendations on various policy matter relating to management education relating to curriculum development structure of management institution new education policy and so on other board members also contribute to some extent on some of the important committees of the aact as their members further aims as an umbrella body comes to the rescue of management institution whenever there is some restrictive procedure imposed on them to fulfill its objectives of professionalization of management education in the country aims conducts and also encourages its members to conduct through its part financing policy a number of faculty development programs and national and international conferences regional round tables of deans and directors of management institutions seminars workshops faculty development case writing research programs and the like even during the covid pandemic period it has continued to organize many so far 38 webinars covering multiple dimensions of economy nep impact of the pandemic likely new normal etc inviting highly distinguished national and international speakers a few faculty and student development programs on startups financial analytics and others were also conducted during this pandemic aims has been funding research project of faculty on management education to the tune of rupees 1 lakh for each project similarly aims has conducted a few case writing workshops and so far 13 good cases have emerged out of these workshops and a few more are planned in the near future that is in the month of april and later aims brings out a half yearly journal titled aims journal of management aims annual management education convention is its flagship program this year the team is rediscovering management education on the pandemic world the road map ahead it is scheduled to take place from 26 to 28 august 2021 many national and international speakers are invited to talk on relevant sub themes we invite all of you to take part in this convention as delegates paper presenters and the like on the basis of selection through national competitions or nomination many prestigious awards are given away at the national convention there are ravi jamata national fellow award 
ఎయిమ్స్ వి స్కూల్ ఇన్నోవేషన్ అవార్డ్ ఎయిమ్స్ ఆర్షియం బెస్ట్ వి స్కూల్ డైరెక్టర్ అవార్డ్ ఎయిమ్స్ బెస్ట్ కేస్ అవార్డ్ ఎయిమ్స్ జేఎల్ బాత్ర బెస్ట్ రీసెర్చ్ పేపర్ అవార్డ్ ఎయిమ్స్ రామస్వామి పిఐఆర్ బెస్ట్ యంగ్ టీచర్ ఎయిమ్స్ ఎక్పై బెస్ట్ టీచర్ అవార్డ్ ఎయిమ్స్ బెస్ట్ స్టూడెంట్ పేపర్ అవార్డ్ ఎయిమ్స్ నేషనల్ మేనేజ్మెంట్ వీక్ అవార్డ్ ఎయిమ్స్ కాన్షియస్ క్యాపిటలిజం కాంపిటీషన్ ఎయిమ్స్ వాంటెడ్ టు హెల్ప్ ఇట్స్ మెంబర్ ఇన్స్టిట్యూషన్ ఇన్ దేర్ అడ్మిషన్ ప్రాసెస్ అండ్ ద ప్రాస్పెక్ట్ మేనేజ్మెంట్ స్టూడెంట్ so it started the aims test for management admission apma in the year 2000 and about 60 tests have been successfully conducted during the last 20 years for the dissemination of information relevant to the management education aims has created a separate portal called aimscommunications.com if you wish to have more detail please visit aims.org.in i express my profound thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity and more particularly dr ramakant patro thank you thank you sir professor dr sujatha mangaraj did her post graduation in personal management and industrial relation from utkal university orissa and subsequently did her mphil and doctoral degree from the same university her doctoral research was in human resource development in public sector steel industry in india and she has undertaken several research projects sponsored by various organizations including ugc she is presently holding the position of the chairperson of indian society for training and development bhuvneshwar chapter and member of education and training and pan- panel of cii bhuvneshwar chapter She has been awarded the most prestigious fellow of IASTD and Kamla Award for Best Women Writer. May I now humbly request Madam Sujatha Mangaraj, the President, Association of Indian Management Schools, to kindly address the gathering. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Esteemed members present, eminent speakers of today's session from across the globe, revered past presidents and executive board members of AIMS, respected directors deans and faculty members of participating institutions invite his guests and dear students a very good afternoon to all of you on behalf of association of indian management schools and on my personal behalf i extend a very warm and hearty welcome to the esteemed speakers and all the participants of the webinar as you all know that industry 4.0 is changing the world around us and is the dream of the future the destiny of india and the spirit of new india industry 4.0 ushered a major technological shift by fusion of new powerful technologies that integrates the physical digital and organic world it is a combined impact of automation and data exchange in manufacturing technologies and organizational models which includes extensive use of digitalization cyber physical systems artificial intelligence big data analytics the internet of things cloud computing and fifth generation mobile telecommunication to mention a few industry 4.0 is certainly not the first big change in human history but it is unprecedented with respect to the speed of the transition that is exponential rather than linear the pace at which technology has evolved is on hard and unseen. It affects all disciplines, economies, industries, and the society at large. There lies a new world, the world of new opportunities with huge potential in connecting billions of people around the globe through digital networks, providing them access to knowledge and services, thus improving the efficiency of organizations, increasing resource productivity, creating value propositions, and generating new forms of employment. The business models, organizational structures, functional processes, skill requirements of employees, and the whole spectrum of activities from production of goods and provision of services to reaching the end users will automatically change. When such paradigm shift takes place, some skills become obsolete and requirements of new skills emerge. and this shift in technology requires a similar revolution in education especially in management education in order to meet the needs of the industry and explore alternative futuristic trends industry 4.0 cannot exist without education 4.0 and business schools have a greater role to play in reinventing themselves to remain relevant 
I think Mr. Subramanyam, he also mentioned the same thing to be relevant. It demands leaders to be critical thinkers, problem solvers, and global players. This demands curriculum 4.0 in line with education 4.0. It requires a comprehensive framework for continuous upgradation of curriculum to meet the required skill gap, access to multiple delivery modes for better integration of technology, individuality, and discovery-based learning. Curriculum 4.0 should go hand in hand with the faculty 4.0. Faculty members should continuously upgrade themselves and focus their efforts on using technological applications that aid cognitive learning. Intelligent digital assets should guide teaching concepts. Teacher-student interaction should be based on a smart approach to make the whole experience engaging and interesting. It is in this context Association of Indian Management Schools is providing platform since its inception to leaders of business schools, to policymakers, and to all stakeholders in teaching learning process to embrace such technological integration through its various initiatives. I think Mr. Venkatasarulu mentioned uh, details that like representing AICT in curriculum upgradation, conducting leadership development programs for deans and directors, case development and faculty development programs for faculty members on contemporary issues of management, real-time simulation games for students, providing financial assistance for conducting seminars and workshops, deans and directors roundtables, research projects on contemporary issues to name a few. This international speaking engagement on Industry 4.0, the role of academia, organized jointly by Bobbins Institute of Management Science, Kolkata and AIMS, will definitely give you a platform for deliberation and discussions on the futuristic demands of the changing times and will highlight the need for education 4.0 along with curriculum 4.0 and for faculty 4.0 for a better tomorrow. I think with this, I once again welcome you all and congratulate Dr. Ramakan Patra for organizing this program. And I also Congratulate Professor Dr. Ratan Sarmasar for taking initiative for moderating this program. I think we have seen now Sarmasar is doing so well by moderating all the most of the webinars of uh, Association of Indian Management School. I hope with the presence of such a galaxy of intellectuals and speakers, the sessions will be invigorating, enriching, and will benefit all. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Madam. Professor R.C. Bhattacharya, Vice Chairman, Globesal Business School, has his education in strategic thinking and management from Wharton Business School, USA. MBA from Cranfield University, UK. The core area of his education includes strategic management, strategic marketing, corporate governance. He is an alumnus of the Cranfield Business School, UK, Wharton Business School, US, and North Staffordshire, UK. He has been teaching industrial marketing, marketing of services, and brand building in industrial markets. With this, let me now request Professor Dr. R.C. Bhattacharya, Chairman, AIMS, Bengal Chapter, to kindly share his insights with us. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sati. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Uh, welcome, one and all, in this AIMS, uh, BIMS webinar. Uh, respected uh, Madam Sang Mangaraj, respected Dr. Ratan Sharma, respected Dr. Subramaniam and my friends, Dr. Patro, Dr. Vakasarlu, and other dignitaries and friends. I am very pleased that AIMS and BIMS organized this particular webinar at the height of the pandemic. Although we have found vaccine and more than 30 lakh people have been already vaccinated, we still have a long way to go to cover 1.2 billion people. Hence, we need to moderate our in calibrating when to go blended and when to go to the old normal back again. So this webinar on Zoom platform was the right decision by Dr. Patra and his team. In India, there are three associations, namely AIMA, MB Universe, and AIMS who talks about management and management education. 
But AIMS, in my opinion, is the only body representing the education institutions. And we talk about quality of education and quality of pedagogy. And we represent about more than 800 business schools. Hence, being members of AIMS, we have a strong duty towards society in terms of maintaining quality of education and availability of education. Today's topic, Industry 4.0, role of academia. I would like to reframe as role of academia in the age of Industry 4.0 is very apt. World has gone through many phases of advancements. Industry 1 was the age of motion, steam engines, etc. Industry 2 was started by Henry Ford in mass production and automation. Industry 3 came with the age of computer and uh, uh, created a knowledge society. But today we are in the age of industry four. We are in the age of di digitalization, artificial intelligence, uh, driving, uh, self-driving, I mean, uh, driverless cars, et cetera, et cetera. This, was, this age was coming anyway, but the pandemic has uh, uh, made it the necessity. How could we otherwise cope up with teaching lakhs and crores of students throughout the world without classroom? As academician, our first duty is to recognize this change, recognize this change, equip our faculty and students with new knowledge about new gadgets and their applications and rediscover appropriate curriculum and appropriate pedagogy for this particular environment. I must warn, however, that we have a duty to those who have handicaps. For example, how to redesign, I mean, realign our old faculty who are not um, in, in tune with digitalization. How to address the need of poor students who cannot manage to buy a computer. What about internet uh, uh, compatibility in the uh, rural areas of the country? I would therefore suggest that academic leaders should try to remember three E's, namely equality, equity, and ethics. In the new norm, I hope that the, the, this new, uh, this deliberation should be fruitful and guide us to take the right path in the future for the quality and availability of employment. With this, I wish every success and I'm sure we will learn a lot from the speakers, learned speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me this platform to express my views. Thank you, Dr. Patro. Thank you, sir. Let me now request Professor Dr. Ramakanta Patra, the principal, Bhatia Vidyadhan Institute of Management Science, Kolkata, and executive board member AIMS to enlighten us with the theme address. Over to you, sir. Sir, kindly unmute yourself. Very good afternoon to everybody, respected uh, guests uh, from India and abroad. Dr. Kohle, thank you very much, sir. And Dr. Avijit Ganguly, thank you, sir. And uh, few speakers from abroad are likely to join a little late. And uh, I am thankful to AIMS for giving us this platform and joining us to organize this particular international speaking engagement on industry 4.0 and the role of academia. I th I'm thankful to all the participants from Pan India students for sparing there this Sunday to join this program. One day they get and they have already spent this Sunday for joining this program. Once again, I express my sincere gratitude to all of you for accepting our invitation and joining this program. When we are thinking, what should be the topic for any program or, or conference or the right, thus now, as I, uh, Dr. Arshivataji just told rightly, that uh, the role of academicians has grown manifold after the Industry 4.0. 
and we thought that we must go for this topic and we decided then we started contacting some speakers they have also agreed now what i understand that industry 4.0 is the digital transformation of manufacturing production and related industries and value creation processes industry 4.0 is used interchangeably with the fourth industrial revolution and represents a new stage in the organization and control of the industrial value chain so that is the basic concept of industry 4.0 what i understand and now our topic is also education 4.0 and these two things interchangeably we are using education 4.0 is nothing but the curriculum of the future as dr subramaniam dr bhattacharya has already mentioned that the educational institutions specifically the higher educational vocational course education they must accept the challenge of the change what are the changes taking place regularly we must accommodate ourselves we must equip ourselves and simultaneously we must deliver the same thing to our students because as dr subramaniam has rightly mentioned the corporate needs today the ready made products so at the finishing school concept they don't give training today earlier they used to take people and give them training in house but now they want the finished product ready made pro corporate made products so now then comes the role of the teacher faculty the faculty must be equally trained because the digitalization because it is now the students sitting from one corner of a particular world or a country or from different parts of the country and they are connected with the internet and we are delivering and now we have to understand whether their needs are fulfilled through whatever we are delivering or first of all we have to understand what is the need and what is the need of the corporate because we are giving the students lesson or teaching only for the keeping in mind the corporate requirements so we have to match all these two align this to corporate requirement student need simultaneously we have to equip ourselves our deliverables should be matching so education 4.0 is nothing but the curriculum of the future it is about evolving with the times and for the higher education institution this means understanding what is required of their future graduates world leaders have led i'll just give you an example mckinsey and company recently made in study and analysis and through this analysis one very interesting thing has come out that only 50% 51% of the total job would be automated so if this is so then which is very shocking for job seekers and educators if not addressed on time the situation could lead to a serious level of unemployment in the coming future so we must address this problem first that what is the majority of hiring managers also believe that ai will impact the types of skills their company is needed so now what we think that we are going to discuss today we are going to listen from our learned speakers today that education 4.0 is education 1.0 was lectures rote learning and memorization and education 2.0 was about internet enabled learning and education 3.0 was knowledge based education and now it is education 4.0 it is innovation based education the traditional teaching pedagogy traditional teaching methods will not work out now everything should be innovativeness should be there creativity should be there otherwise application oriented should be there project based should be there digitalization should be there otherwise you know this education 4.0 is going to get a shock next is what, what are the challenges i find that the following are the challenges a more personalized learning more remote learning and plethora of educational tools project based learning easy and accurate assessment and data at the fingerprints 
these are the trends coming out we have to explore all the possibilities and after all i would like to i will not take more time with the honorable speakers are there everybody is waiting to listen from them i will summarize by saying that the top 10 digital education demands of the education 4.0 this top 10 demands are number 1 complex problem solving skill critical thinking skill creativity skill people management skill then coordinating with others cognitive flexibility negotiation skill service orientation skill and alignment skill judgment skill and lastly emotional intelligence so these are the issues which are coming during the digital uh digitalization of the education 4.0 and i'll request that uh, all the speakers uh, to highlight in all these areas uh, so that uh, the faculty members the students uh, can understand what should be their role what should be the role of a teacher what should be the role of a student and what should be the role of the corporate as well so with the, this word i conclude and thank you very much ems once again and thank you all the participants all the speakers uh, thank you thank you very much thank you sir with this we move forward to the awaited panel discussion of the day's event allow me to introduce the speakers in the panel to everyone here today before i do so i seek your consideration in making the introduction a brief one as it had to be tailored keeping in mind the time constraint Dr. Gautam Suthadar is currently pursuing as the director of NIT Manipur. He has completed his PhD in engineering from Birla Institute of Technology, Ranchi. After five years of industrial experience in Hindustan Motors Limited and Indian Railways, he joined as faculty member in National Institute of Foundry and Forge Technology, Ranchi. After that, he had served Sirampur Col Textile College and Kalyani Govan Engineering College about ten years, and finally he had joined as professor, Department of Mechanical Engineering of Jadavpur University, Kolkata. He taught many subjects like like manufacturing processes, mechanical handling of materials, metrology, machine technology, etc. He has authored two books from New Age Publishers, New Delhi, and published more than seventy-five technical papers in referred journals of national and international importance. Professor Dr. Mohan Kolhe is working as a full professor in. in energy systems engineering with focus on smart grid and renewable energy systems at university of agde norway he has also received the offer of hafsland professorship in smart grid from the norwegian university of science and technology dr kolhe has more than 25 years of academic experience at international level on electrical and renewable energy systems he is a leading renewable energy technologist and has previously held positions at the world's prestigious universities example university college london University of Dundee UK University of Jarvis Kaila Finland and Hydrogen Research Institute Canada The next speaker Dr Sanjay Chen is the president in the operations of Amnial Pharmaceuticals in an American domicile publicly traded generics and specialty pharmaceutical company The company is headquartered in New Jersey He has extensive experience in managing operations validation and quality as well as regulatory audits originating from the US FDA MHRA U EU TGA MCC and Health Health Canada by joining Amnil Dr Sanjay Health Quality and Operations positions at Ranbaxy Laboratories Jaidus Kadila Torrent Pharmaceuticals Kadila Pharmaceuticals etc the next speaker Dr Celia Shahnaz is currently serving as a professor with Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology she has published more than 100 international journal and conference papers her research interests include speech analysis speech enhancement digital watermarking biomedical signal processing audio visual recognition for biometric security system uh, control systems robotics and signal processing and pattern recognition for power signals Dr Celia is a fellow of ieb dr abhijit gangli is a chartered fellow and chartered manager of chartered management institute of uk fellow of higher education academy uk certified professor of university of northwest europe netherland and an accredited management consultant and program head of mba and doctorate in business administration he is also a certified trainer in management and leadership he has got more than 25 years of global experience 
in multiple industry verticals and academic, including corporate training and guiding doctoral and MBA students. He is also heading doctorate in business administration program of Liverpool John Moore University, UK. Mr. Shribal Chatterjee is currently working as a retail specialist, omni channel and distribution. Northern Ontario with Westro Foods Canada. He was previously an area manager with fashion retail with Calius US and uh, Calius Specialty Footwear Fashion Stores, <coughs> managing fourth highest volume stores in North America. He has worked in India with companies like Airtel and Bata India in retail operations, managing multi-regional store operations. Completed BCom from Nagpur University, MBA from Indian Institute of Social Welfare and Business Management. Dr. Indranil Bose has been working in the capacity of Dean with the School of Business with the University of Bolton, UK at the International Academic Center based at uh, Ras Al Khaimah, UAE. He has also been in panel faculty for the global MBA program offered by the Northwood University, Michigan, USA, under the International Partnership Agreement with the University of Bolton. Dr. Indranil has the experience of teaching diverse students growth, pursuing the vocational business management curriculum from level four to level seven under different UK-based awarding bodies such as Pearson, Educual, IAAP, etc. His teaching expertise lies in research methods, strategy, HRM, and employee relations, workforce modeling, etc. He has proven record of research and publications in peer-reviewed journals listed with Australian Business Dean's Council. <coughs> So with this, I request, uh, uh, okay, uh, with this, may I now request the moderator of the session, Dr. Ratan Sharma, to kindly take over the dais. And before that, let me introduce you to Dr. Sharma. <coughs> Professor Dr. Sharma has a PhD in finance from University of Delhi. He is currently principal director at Vivekananda Institute of Professional Studies. He has a rich experience of more than 40 years in the field of education and has worked at various prestigious Indian Institute of Management, Lucknow, Management Development Institute, MTI Gurgaon, SPJ Institute of Management and Research, Mumbai, where he served as director of Center of Family Managed Business. He is the former president of Association of Indian Management Schools. With this, may I now request Dr. Sharma to kindly take over the dais. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Swati. This is wonderful, really. And uh, I'm extremely privileged to have such a wonderful panel. It will be very enriching, the discussion that we will have it on a very contemporary topic that we got it. Uh, because the panel is so uh, well, not only qualified, such an experience coming both from the industry as well as from the academia. Uh, and as mentioned by the previous speakers, I think it has been a wonderful, in fact, uh, the, the theme which has been chosen for the today's panel discussion. Um, I really am thankful uh, to Dr. Patra and um, I extend a very hearty and warm welcome to every one of you that I'm given this opportunity to really moderate the whole session. I won't take much time, but coming to the theme per se, because we have also really to have the time in mind. As I understand, Industrial Revolution 4.0 is personal opinion. It is in fact from journey right from what we say pre-historical days to the steam engine coming to the mass production, then getting into the internet and then getting to the digitization, which we refers to the AI, machine learning, etc what we say, the Industrial Revolution 4.0. This journey, in fact, is a journey of human development per se. And when I say it's a journey of the human development, what I meant is that I think the skill level and the knowledge level, which was required at the time of, say, the first Industrial Revolution were very different than what we were having uh, in the subsequent stages of development of the human uh, race. Now, with this in mind, I think this we are coming a stage because uh, as a business school, uh, we have been really aware of it. And I, I personally, I felt, and I'm sure my academic colleagues were aware of it. There are two, three things happening at the same time simultaneously. We were getting into 21st century and there were first of all a pressure that how really to get into 21st century. There are a lot many challenges, of course, leading to a lot many opportunities also. Then, of course, it was a very important thing which happened is that Industrial Revolution 4.0 also came in between, which means that we need really to have a very different mindset altogether and that sort. And third thing which happened and which has also been mentioned is the pandemic, which really has happened and still continuing, in fact. 
Uh, therefore, three very important things are happening simultaneously. Now, with coming to the Industrial Revolution 4.0, as a business school, in fact, we were aware. In fact, in India, most of us, we were aware as a faculty. But it has also been a very clear, and I think something which was happening is whatever we have been teaching in the field of education, management in particular, whether I belong to the management education field, whatever we have been teaching, there has been a gap with what is happening in the industry, which means industry was feeling it that what we are teaching is not relevant for them. This gap was, we have been told. Let me tell you very frankly from my personal example, in, uh, I joined Lucknow IIM in 1985. Very first thing when they came to being, we heard this, there's a gap between what we teach and what industry looks for. We try to cover this gap. Not that we didn't try as a faculty, we try. In fact, all, all over the world, I think this happens including India. We try to fill in, we try to bridge this gap. But gap becomes, you know, changes are so fast and nature of changes are so much then more we try, more the gap really increases. And therefore, result is that still we are finding after 40 years or 30 years that there is a gap between what we are teaching and what really is happening. Superimposed is Industrial Revolution 4.0. Now, that is the type of situation as an academic world we feel, in fact, in this. Now, coming to that, and this is a question now, sir. I'm sure we got Dr. Kohli with us as of now. Uh, Abhijit uh, Ganguly, sir, you are also there, Dr. Ganguly. And uh, Dr. Selya, you also joined it. You're welcome, in fact, on behalf of AIMS and also the uh, BIMS Institute and everyone. And uh, we got Dr. Sanjay Jain also. I think there are four people joining as of now. Others will be joining, I believe. Uh, am I right? Is it all right? This yes, sir. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, right, sir. Right. Fine. So yes, sir. I first pose a question, I think, and we have to very brief little. Interstellar revolution has been mentioned by everyone speaker the, before we uh, spoke. What do you feel is the impact we had it in the context in society in general to begin with? We will take academia later, society in general, because academia exists in the society per se. So what is that you find? Briefly, just brief, how do you look at it? Dr. Kole, how do you look at Industrial Revolution 4.0 impact on the society in general? The Industrial Revolution 4 is impacting our day-to-day -day social life. And uh, all of us, we are well connected or integrated within the society with each other. So we have to see that the same uh, integration, right, which we are having through mobile or maybe through Internet of Things, it should also happen within the industry. So that is the industrial revolution four, which is going to be based on a cyber physical system. So based on that, we have to train our next generation professionals. We have to train our society, society also, how we are going to deal with industrial revolution four using our cyber, using new developing cyber physical system, how the society, they can get benefit, not only from education or industry point, of you, but also from the health point of view, transportation point of view, agriculture point of view, all these points we need to incorporate in our society or to educate our society and develop the system in our society for getting ready for the next revaluation. Thank you. Right, so, so nice of you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 Dr. Ganguly, how do you really respond to that? I know well, uh, uh, well, Professor Sharma, thank you for this opportunity. First of all, Dr. Patra and and all of you. And uh, yes, I mean, uh, academy is a part of society, and without society, we don't belong anywhere. So that's the place where we belong to. And each one of us has got a responsibility towards that particular thing. And industrial industry four or industrial revolution four is not an exception to it. So as uh, Professor Mohanlal Kohli has said that, uh, uh, that it has to have a holistic impact on the various aspects of the life, the major focus of Industry 4 is not only how to align education with the corporate needs, but, but the most importantly, how to align education with the societal needs. That's very important because this is where uh, education also need to contribute to, to the industry and the society uh, at large. 
But having said this, I said that integration has become very, very, uh, uh, very, very important part of it because the think tank, which are intelligent militia, as you call it, uh, you know, come from the academic uh, part and academics across the world, whether we are in India or, or any other part of the world, it doesn't matter because technology has breached the gap of, you know, the distance gap. We are now close to each other, just flick, flick of a button, we can reach to each other. Okay. And we have overcome the time gap and all those kind of uh, thing as well. So technology enables a lot of things. But how we are using technology, how, how we are making our life better, how we are giving back return to the society. I mean, these are the questions always dog, uh, in, in mind when we think that how industry four or how education is going to deliver towards the industry four revolutions. But as mm, I would rather say that uh, the, that society could be a focal point for educationist or academia to begin with, and then to begin the process of alignment. And, and the corporate is also a part of social uh, entity. You know, they are not beyond that. And they need to increasingly play the role of uh, social responsibility. So you have, uh, all of us have seen the kind of uh, devastating effect uh, it has created across the world by a mindless uh, operations of the different organizations, mighty organizations worldwide. And uh, the case in point is Nigeria. The case in point is Mexico Gulf and all those areas where, uh, and, and, and the different parts of the world, even in India, you will find is a mindless operation is not helping to give back return to the society. So industry four is not only digitalizations or internet of things or robotics. It is beyond that. It is beyond that in a sense that how we use technology to uh, to contribute to the societal needs, how we use technology, uh, how we integrate technology in our day-to-day -day life, which can help the poor farmers to get the, uh, to get the returns you know, of their crops, how it can help the poor laborers, how it can help the downtrodden people of the society, how it can help across the spectrum, I mean to say, of entire society to get the help, you know. So, so I think I think it's a huge role need to be played. I think in as as the discussion progress, uh, I may bring out certain other uh, factors uh, into the discussions. Okay, so I think this this is what to to begin with. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Ganguly. You pointed in an interesting point. Uh, Dr. Sanjay, uh, Dr. Sanjay Jain, how you look at the whole process, which is what is in the context of society, I Industrial Revolution 4.0? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, word is a global village and, uh, you know, in, in initiation of uh, Industry 4.0 uh, started from Germany and, you know, all Europe. So it has an impact being in a global village and, India is in a manufacturing hub for anything and specifically for pharmaceutical. We know, we all know that now it has become a, uh, the, the place for the, you know, pharmacy of the world basically. And it has an impact overall basically because of the cost or competitiveness, because of the quality which we have to deliver uh, being, you know, it is, it is uh, delivered to the patients uh, and the speed of the deliverance, everything. So, there are a lot of anxiety because of uh, implementation of uh, Industry 4.0. There are a lot of challenges, but at the same time, uh, now as a society, we have to gear up, whether it is academia or the industry, uh, the current employees, we have to upgrade ourselves to ensure that we adapt those changes, embrace those changes. So I think uh, that, that both industry and academia has to gear up to meet, meet those expectations. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Jain and uh, Ma'am Saria. How do you look at the whole process of society come from Bangladesh? Yes, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation. It's a great honor to remain present with all the academician and industry experts uh, who have 
uh, really a huge experience. So based on my experience for last 20 years and what I have seen in Canada during my PhD study as a Canadian Commonwealth scholar, the emerging technology has been embraced by uh, North America long back. But, you know, uh, for our countries in the subcontinent, especially in Bangladesh, we, the country is very much emerging, but we are in the middle of the pandemic. What is important for us to relate our research and academic activities to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? You know that those 17 Sustainable Development Goals. We have missed these three revolutions, but we don't want to miss this industry four revolution. So, so I will see that uh, uh, there is a, we have a 16 crore people in our country and there are a lot of people are COVID affected, but there are not equal number of nurses. So this is the time for telemedicine because not all people have the capacity uh, to do those x-ray and come to the city med center during the lockdown and do those testing. So this is the time for uh, us to use the cloud system, to use the deep learning technique, to detect the COVID automatically from x-ray images and send it uh, to the patient uh, via the doctors who are in the remote location. So this is the time for us, those implementing this telemedicine because it will help uh, the need of creating a lot of COVID centers, we, which we cannot do automatically overnight. But what we can do using this technology, we can give the service to the people who are really affected. And now coming about our country, who are our, our, our agriculturists, our farmers, our silent heroes. And we can see in the last 20 years that previously we used to buy food from outside. Now not a single thing for our food uh, we buy from outside. And it has been done by our agriculturists. But you know, now it is locked down. Our farmers cannot go to the petty field. And they are doing repeatedly different generations after generations. They are doing some manual jobs. So this is time to help them using app uh, to how to create the smart agriculture. How can they change their production cycle? How can they change their type of uh, grains they are doing? And not only that, if you go to our, uh, and you know, Bangladesh is the highest uh, Rohingya refugee. This is the largest uh, refugee embraced by Bangladesh. And there is, it is a restricted area. They really need mass vaccination and other things. So we cannot send expert nurse to push injection there. So we need also automatic feedback systems so that from the remit location, those mass vaccination can be done. And now you see Bangladesh is the second highest garment producing industry and majority of them are women who are working there. So to provide them with health education, uh, awareness, so automatic surveillance to creating um, awareness about using the personal protection equipment, uh, using the hand gloves. So those are the apps or automatic alarm system to measure the temperature so that they don't uh, come too close to give an automatic alarm kit for them for social distancing. These are very important for our garment industry. And these are all part of industrial revolution. Now coming to the next point. Now, uh, the people who are with a, with a day to day earning, they need to go out. Uh, we can uh, sitting at home and use all the technology to give our lectures to do all the webinars and seminars. But what about those people who need to earn every day? So, what we have to do, we have to give them some sort of, I should say, disinfection. I have seen in Singapore, they have done disinfection robots, implement disinfection robots so that our public places remain safe. So it is our time to employ and deploy them for a populated country like Bangladesh, India. So, so that our people who are at road for earning their bread, they remain safe. 
So these are some societal things which I really have seen. Not only that, if you can deploy those disinfection robots, then you can, of course, implement to your schools because we don't see whether the third wave will come or not. And we cannot uh, sit at our home and our schools are closed. Even when we, our schools will be open, our, we need those disinfection robots in our schools, in our campuses. So these are some example that where our society really need to embrace this industry for, and we need to really equipped with knowledge and collaboration with the industry. Thank you. So nice of you, ma'am. So nice of you. I think now we come to a very interesting part that the purpose of management or any education is to better the society welfare. I think that we all agree. And uh, here comes the role of academia. If that being the case, then what is that we should do? And uh, maybe if you permit me, we can divide this for a, for a fruitful discussion. Knowledge that we provide and the skill that we should have, the type of attitude and the role faculty can have it, students can have it likewise. So I think we, if you permit me, we can have that sort of a uh, discussion. Is that all right, Dr. Kohle, Dr. Sanjay? Oh, oh yes, that's fine. And I have prepared a couple of slides also based on your uh, points. So maybe okay. then I will share that also. Oh, sure, know? it will be wonderful. We'll share to the audience also. It will be great. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, Kamboli, will that be okay? I think yeah. it's that. So because, you know, it is something like that uh, from you, we want to have maximum, you know, for enriching ourselves as sure, to how sure. we should do from the academic world, what we should be doing it. You people coming from a very varied experiences. So let me start with Dr. Kole with you only. Uh, yes. We need the industrial revolution is there, fair, that's we all agree. And uh, I asked, I started with the society question relating to the society with Dr. Ganguly said it, yes. Because I believe it that society, without society, welfare, you can't have any other welfare. Either it's a corporate or individual or whatever. So society has to be in the picture. Education is also for improving the welfare of the society. If that being the case, then what is the role academia has got it to provide knowledge to begin with and skills later on? And then maybe the whole attitude, that's the framework we have it. And as a faculty, what we should do, which type of course and curriculum we can have it, what type of, you know, pedagogy we can adopt and so on and so forth, given all the situation. That's broadly is the theme we will try to discuss for another, say, 45 minutes or so or, or an hour or so, so that we can just have our colleagues, those who are from the faculty and also students, they can really enjoy and they can take away something from it. So, Dr. Kohli, we start with you. The type of yes, we provide in this. Uh, yeah, and so, how we, yeah. Uh, I will start with my presentation. Oh, sure. And, then we can, uh, uh, in my presentation, I have called most of the point uh, which you have mentioned. Give me one minute. Good. So I hope that all of you are in a position to my slide or presentation. Yes, sir. Yes. yes, sir. Very yes. good. So now we have seen that due to this pandemic situation, the traditional education system we need to change. Okay. And uh, that education system should be based on cyber physical system. And this uh, cyber physical system based education is going to contribute not only towards the industrial revolution code, but also the societal needs also, because we need to change our way of living based on a new technology development, as well as how the changes are happening within the society, let's say, due to the pandemic situation. Based on that, let's say, if we consider our industrial revolutions, industrial revolution one, which started, let's say, at the end of the 18th century, that time it was based on steam engine, mechanical and manufacturing. And at that time, the training was based on physical labor, basic engineering, and how to learn the proper skill. Then when we have the electricity, mass production, then different division of labors have been done. Then the 
talent which was required for that purpose it was how we had to do the business how we had to reduce the risk standardization and certainty and now we are at this moment in industrial revolution 3 which is based on the computer automation and manufacturing where we are training or educating our uh, students or ourselves also with expertise on a particular discipline and giving more focus on science technology engineering mathematics but now due to this pandemic situation and due to the change in the technologies we have to move towards the cyber physical system which is going to be based on internet of things where we need to have the expertise of learning agility adaptability empathy and multidiscipline together so based on that if we consider here i have taken one simple example of industrial revolution or let's say if and especially my example is based on the energy system because i have expertise on or my background is on a smart energy system so here you can see that when we are integrating the different type of energy technologies together including the conventional power generation to the intermittent renewable energy sources so where there we have to utilize the knowledge and the domain of a different disciplines together to have the operation seamless or smooth operation so that we can get the energy in a reliable way and systematic way so how it is going to happen it is going to happen through the cyber physical system based for example let's say in in our home we want to do some home energy management system just i'm giving one example let's say and we want to utilize the centralized approach and that centralized approach is going to be based on cyber physical system which is going to consider our human or consumers comforts also and preferences all so which type of load he want to shift and like that and at the same time we want to integrate not the conventional or controllable energy sources but also the non conventional or intermittent renewable energy sources so these are going to be integrated well together by using in, uh, information communication technologies and a different type of business models in well integrated with each other then only we will be in a position to have the different type of energy sources which have been integrated together and going to operate smoothly for providing for providing us as a user reliable and continuous power supply where the users can also participate through their for example through the home energy management system so here just i have taken one example the same example or the same things can also be incorporated in the health system in our university we are working on the e health system where we are considering the cyber physical system for example the old people they are living at their home and they have all the sensors and like that for example if they have anything is happening let's say if they have the apple i watch or maybe samsung smart watch then we are in a position to get all the data information at the centralized server and then we, then the automatically it will be analyzed and it will give us the geographical location also and you can see that based on the history of that person what type of diseases or what type of activities are happening with that and accordingly we can send the ambulance or provide the facility to that so all these things are going to be based on cyber physical system or maybe let's say the next and for that we need to change our education system which is going to be based on industrial revolution four now coming back to the research side here i have taken one typical example from the ieee and i have searched especially from the engineering point of view with reference to the cyber space so how the different domains of the cyber physical system have been already researched and a lot of research work is already there now it is time to use those research work in our education system as well as in developing the industry okay so here let's say if we take in the cyber space for example if we take let's say the healthcare system okay in the healthcare system we have so many things those we have we need to be integrated together for that we will need not only the domain knowledge of the medical sciences but also the domain knowledge of the information communication technologies together and how we have to integrate all these things together right so that is going to be a very interesting thing and for that purpose we need to uh, change our education system for example how we are going to train our uh, next generation on the cyber security how we are going to educate our next generation on augmented reality how we are going to 
do the big data analysis, how you can have the autonomous system or uh, additive manufacturing also, autonomous vehicles, system integration, cloud computing, internet of things. So it is going to become very complex system. So to, to analyze this complex system, right, so we have to, I'll skip this right, we have to change our education system. So here I have taken one uh, slide, which we are following in our university also. So like education one, right, it was basically based on the teacher center. What the teacher they are teaching and the students they were following. So now if we go to the education revolution two, right, so their learner are replaced, replaced as knowledge, okay, where how the students or the learners, they are responding with the, to the teacher and how they have been integrated together. Then now we are basically on the education three, where we have our teachers, they are more like a facilitator and we are doing more collaborative based learning, project based learning. We are using um, uh, different uh, e-learning platforms also and at the same time we are doing the social networking for the education purpose but now we have to change our education to match or to fulfill the expected demand of changes in the all all sectors of the society right and that education should be education poor where learner has to be as a uh, creators also and as a constructivist also where learner can all be also the producer and the share so they wait can be as a curriculum also learner can also become the connection maker also and the information which we are going to have it should have the open access also and we, but then we can take as a learner as a teacher also we can have the access to the experts also so here i will give you one example let's say uh, someone who is sitting in the canada or the united kingdom or they are having the expertise in the A area, right? And for example, let's say I'm having the expertise in the B area and we want to train the student which is located in the, uh, let's say, in another uh, country or somewhere. And we want to utilize the knowledge of A and B together to train the students or to educate the student who are at the, let's say, another geographical location. So for that, we have to utilize the cyber physical system. We have to optimize the resources. For example, in my university or at my lab, we have some uh, uh, typical facilities which are available. Maybe that facility may not be available at another location. So how the students of that location can be used the facility of my location using the cyber physical system. So we have to change our education based on this concept where we can have the more cyber physical system based learning without any boundaries and without moving from uh, without moving from one point to an, another point and we can optimize the resources and we can train the next generation professionals so based on that then we have to make some lot of changes in our education system so first thing like basically theory will always be going to be there so we have to always consider that knowledge concept and math basics that will always be there but then another thing which is going to be required that is going to be the cyber physical system based based labs where we can have the practical experimentation multidisciplinary learning in depth analysis and, and understanding and how we can incorporate the new technology so that feedback has to be incorporated into the theory and we have to do the curriculum integration and then we, then we have to come for the market side how we are going to develop the products so how the products are going to be there uh, developed for the region what type of skills are going to be there which type of new business models we need to be developed so here for the from the industrial output point of view or maybe making it more if we want to have the technology readiness level let's say at the seven or eight level then we have to see that how the cyber physical system labs can be incorporated into the product development and how that feedback can be integrated into the uh, cps labs right and then here you can see that the education system how it is going to be evolved with reference to the theory with reference to the cyber physical system laboratory and with reference to the products which we are we want going to develop for the society development or maybe for the sustainable development of the society where we can have the local socioeconomic development and the local integration of that so based on that then we have to consider the different foundations together so first foundation for the education platform
form should be basic computing concept. Second foundation should be computing for the physical world. Third foundation should be discrete and continuous mathematics. Next foundation, it should be cross-cutting application of sensing, actuation, control, communication, and com uh, computing also. And next foundation, then, how we have to model the heterogeneous and dynamic system, and how we have to integrate control and computing and communication together. And based on that, then, how we are going to develop the cyber physical system. So our education platform, or for the new education policy, should consider or should give more focus on developing the new curriculum based on the cyber physical system and where we should be in a position to use the resources and the knowledge available across the globe and we should treat as a global village together and so that we can have the sustainable development of our globe not only for a particular location but at every places. So, but there are a lot of academic opportunities also for doing this one. So here, then we have to see that how science and engineering foundations, they have to be integrated, how the system engineering approach should be there, how we have to make the applied development and deployment also. And basically, finally, we want to have the workforce for continuing our uh, industrial revolution or adaptation of new technology for the development of the society. And of course, there are going to be many challenges also. Scientific and technical challenges are always there, okay? And on top of that, we have to consider institutional, social, and other challenges. So then it is going to be the cyber physical system based, uh, cyber physical based system. So we have to consider about security and privacy and the trust also. Effective model of governance, how we are going to create new type of business models also because the uh, how we are do, uh, how the present business models are working they may not work under the cyber physical system how we have to change our multidisciplinary education and collaboration and how the skilled works workforce can be developed with reference to that and of course with uh, with reference to the scientific and technical challenges they are going to be many right so those also we need to address and we need to, to integrate that in our education system so here what i feel that when we are talking about the industrial revolution board and especially from the education system point of view, we have to see that how the different technology or different um, sectors, they have to be integrated together, how we have to train our next generation professionals, also how we can become the lifelong learner also. And based on that, then we have to see that how, what type of specific needs for a particular system is going to be there. Based on that, how we are going to do the digitization, data, society development, social welfare, many things are there. Right? So it is a very big challenge if we were, if when we have to develop our education board, right, based on cyber physical system. And with reference to that, here I can say that uh, in uh, at Norway, at my university, we have a couple of centers which are taking, especially focusing on cyber physical system based e-health, where we are uh, doing a lot of laboratory based or the real time based research work. For example, in our lab, we have the old age caring home and where the people, they are living there and um, old age home and we are in a position to collect all the data and the information in a secure way. And then we are, uh, then the experts, they are monitoring that based on the data and monitoring, then they are in a position to analyze like what type of calls are happening, how this type of disease is there old age people they have, how we can care them and how we can reduce the timing of the nurses also and at what time we can provide a particular information to the old age people and like that. That is a one point. And second point, like we have also the uh, one more project that was on a smart energy system that was a home energy management system, which we installed in 100 houses in Norway and 100 houses in Switzerland. And we monitored that remotely from the Germany and then we were in a position to monitor the consumption of the typical electrical loads, right? In selected houses in Norway and selected houses in Switzerland, considering the user preference, 
or user behavior. So that was also the you can say that one of the example of cyber physical system or industrial revolution. And the learning from these projects we are incorporating in our teaching also the students master students bachelor students and the phd students also they are working on that and doing further research work so thank you thank you dr kole is a very nice and very elaborate presentation uh, you said applied knowledge is very important and uh, you mentioned about the engineering part may i now request uh, professor sanjay uh, jain as to how you look at the whole issue of uh, the role of academia and the uh, which is knowledge in per se uh, the skill that we look for the attitude we look for how what is that we should do we want to have some road map because we are confused i mean I, I put it this way let me put it this way you people coming from a different world i know belong to india we are talking about ir1 uh, ir4.0 but we are still in education 1.0 i don't know whether people agree or not i didn't even digitize world you know before pandemic I didn't use Google Meet. I didn't use Zoom. I did not use MS Team. Right? I was still good at uh, the physical, you know, teaching. Now the question is that what is that we should do it? What sort of a thing we should go for it? So role that we look for it. Please tell us as to how we can have your views on this, sir, uh, Dr. Sanjay. So, Dr. Ratan, I think you rightly touched upon. You know, uh, you you already uh, you know admitted that there's a huge gap in academia and industry, yes. and I I completely agree. <laughs> Uh, i also feel that the curriculum is still uh, what we were uh, studying in our uh, during our graduation and post graduation programs and still it is there same you know hardly some changes are there so there's a need that it has to uh, change to the next level and uh, and we are talking about industry 4.0 nevertheless like we are still in education 1.0 we can jump and directly go and reach to education 4.0 and i think uh, it was a great presentation uh, dr kole has explained everything that there are nine pillars very important nine pillars as far as industry 4.0 is concerned and uh, he spoke about augmented reality system integration cloud computing big data and analytics 3d printing is going to be the future iot is going to be one of the important thing which has to happen in all the industry whether it is automobile or chemical or pharmaceutical or healthcare or fmcg or telecom everywhere and cyber security is definitely yes and autonomous robots which is going to uh, improve the efficiency in almost all the uh, organizations and simulation which is very important so as to uh, work on the designing of uh, any any uh, design in the pharmaceutical or any industry uh, the simulation has to happen so what is important is that uh, any any graduate or any student who is passing out of the university should possess all the knowledge uh, whether uh, whether uh, it is about the internet of thing or whether it is 3d printing and the important is that the person the, the student once join an industry as an employee should be able to implement the knowledge in the industry and there is need to integrate the industry 4.0 into the engineering study programs or any other programs because Uh, it's not like only engineering student should be uh, knowing all these subjects. So everywhere, as you said, that you also learn Zoom and other things. So it, it is important that every curriculum, whether it's a pharmacy graduate or engineering students or any any science student, should have all subjects. May not to that extent which early engineering student would have, but at least basic should be taught uh, in, during the uh, during their graduation program and post graduation program. So definitely, academia need to. ensure by changing the curriculum the students get familiarized with the basics of industry 4.0 so there is a need to have a practical lab session which dr kole rightly uh, touched upon there is a need to have a training workshop so as to get the hands on experience i was reading couple of literatures and somewhere it is mentioned that there is need to have a learning factories within the academic institute so the students are given those challenges uh they they are asked to uh, learn to learn, learn learning factories and then so as to when they pass out and join as an employee in the organization they are able to meet the expectations are able to deliver uh, uh to the organization so uh, that's what my views thank you oh thank you very much doctor and thank you thank you very much doctor ganguly how do you look at the whole scenario in fact in this context doctor abhijit ganguly Uh, uh yes dr sharma uh 
thank you uh, once again for this. And it was a nice presentation by Professor Mohal Al Kohle uh, uh, and uh, nicely contributed by Professor Sonia Jain. The thing is this, that I take the clue from there and, and extend my discussion on this. The thing, um, the curriculum to be changed, first of all, because, because this is where uh, we are responsible for, because if we want or expect students to deliver what the organization and the society needs, then the much of the responsibility lies on our shoulder, the kind of pedagogic kind of of curriculum we are bringing over here. But you must have seen, I mean, quite a few months back, there was a international headlines uh, in Economist and, and, and the various other magazines worldwide. I mean, the highly reputed magazines, they were carrying the uh, headlines that MBA has lost relevance. And in UK, uh, where, where I'm based at, a huge amount of discussions going on that whether MBA has got any relevance. So similarly, there could be, I'm not singling out MBA, there could be various other educations, which is almost on the verge of losing its relevance, primarily because of the old curriculum or primarily because of non-transitioning to the industry for requirements. So we are not transitioning the way we need to transition the, we are not understanding the need uh, as such, and we are just doing what we used to do or what we have, uh, you know, go, uh, what we have done to get the success. So I think the time has come to effect changes in curriculum delivery, okay, engagement, and all these areas. And if you if you honestly uh, look at it, so teach. Uh, nowadays, the the delivery, in, uh, according to me, should not be uh, teacher centric. It should be more student centric. So, student led education is going to give them more and more, you know, the onus of responsibility in terms of learning and bringing the things. Because it's not that no amount of lecture is going to be sufficient to make them industry proficient. But yes a huge amount of mentoring, coaching, and, and you know, transferring the knowledge and skills in terms of the framework. But in UK, we call it PLTS. Uh, I don't know whether in India we have any similar kind of uh, things. Uh, PLTS is professional learning and transferable skills. So where we map and measure, normally in Europe, they have certain amount of modalities, but in UK, we have a very clearly defined system. And we have the benchmarks, uh, which is normally, uh, uh, you know, uh, every day, or, or I'll not say every day, I mean, uh, normally on a regular basis, they are revising the curriculum and, and the pedagogy of delivery and all. So I think uh, the transition needs to be done in terms of mindset, in terms of um, bringing uh, real changes in, in curriculum development in terms of bringing, and, uh, uh, bringing uh, the responsibility, I mean, shifting the responsibility from teacher to, to the student. But does it mean the teacher is going freehand? Teacher is playing the role. There is a change in role of the teacher. They are more of a mentor, more of a coach, and uh, more of a, a facilitator rather than a teacher. And I think one of the model, uh, what could be used for industry four kind of situation or to handle the challenges of industry four is a flip teaching model. And the flip teaching model where you give the responsibility to the students in terms of taking the learning engine on and, and learn from roles they play over there Okay, based on the learning happen, uh, you know, beyond the classroom. So this is where, uh, I mean, the kind of uh, innovativeness or the kind of creativity required on teacher's part in terms of how and what we should do to deliver the right curriculum and, and to create the right level of engagement of the students. Now, if you ask me the define right level of engagement, that's, that's a very tough word. 
to, to define the right level of engagement, but the engagement which makes the student feel interested about the curriculum, where the students take their own initiatives to learn and, and, uh, and you know, to grow, and where the industry come forward and, and, and recruit more and more students because they feel that they are fulfilling the need of them. So this is where the, the this, this, is, this is what is a byproduct of engagement again, it's coming up. So this is, I feel the academia need to play a very, very major role in terms of redefining themselves, rede reinventing themselves and uh, redefining, reinventing and making them relevant. That's where it is because, uh, you know, many, many times I have seen the students, they normally feel that this is another lecture or uh, we have to go to the classroom because we are supposed to be there, but it's, it's not the fact. The fact is that the student should push the teacher or that, that, that they don't want to know more and more. And it depends on how we, uh, we, how we kindle the interest in their mind in terms of knowledge acquisitions or in terms of you know, the skill acquisitions and all those kind of stuff. So I, I feel there is, there's a lot of changes required in terms of delivery and and so responsibility lies with the academia in terms of redefining their curriculum, pedagogy delivery. And then, uh, and then I, I would say that uh, uh, to, to reinvent themselves in, in, in line with the societal needs or in line with the global requirements. So uh, this is what is my submission at this moment of time, probably we we come back with more thoughts as we progress further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ganguly. In fact, it's wonderful. Uh, may I now request, ma'am, Dr. Sanaj, please, your views on this role of academia. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the outstanding presentation from Dr. Mohan and uh, feedback from Sanjay and uh, Dr. Avijit Ganguly. So uh, let me summarize from based on my own experience, you know, uh, that uh, uh, we are suddenly in lockdown from 25th March here in Bangladesh. And we are, uh, but, and we sent our students who were in residential hall to the uh, villages and the, their hometown with poor connectivity. But at the same time, from the government and from our need and passion, we really need to uh, continue our education in online. So, we could anyhow learned our MS teams and made our education system online, but what about them? Could, you, could we ensure the connectivity of the uh, students for them, we are giving the teaching. Some of my students are uh, climbing on the rooftop. Some are going to the petty field. Some are going near the temple to get the connectivity. So it is important for us to ensure education for uh, to connectivity of each student. We really need to have a survey. And we really did it from our university. And not only that, we need we we did a survey that whether they have a financial capacity to ensure those uh, GP uh, ensure those modem to ensure their balance uh, in the mobile phone or to even have a capacity to buy a laptop. So our university have. Um, uh, have uh, made this survey and ensured financial um, low interest loan and support to our students to support their internet connectivity, to support and buy their laptops or anything. Because otherwise we will be, because we are lying in the university campus and we can use MS Teams, we can use Canvas, we can use Google Meet and, but what happens to whom we will deliver? This is important. And another uh, policy we have to really do that we are doing with our um, uh, internet service provider, our telecom company, our um, uh, telecommunication regularity commission, and that even if you cannot, if you cannot ensure the optical fiber connected to your laptop, 
then you cannot ensure the connectivity. So it is important to talk with the policy maker because even if you can give them 4G in their modem, but you cannot ensure the connectivity because the tower of the network is not near her or his village home. So these are the critical things we really need to talk with the policymaker that we did in our university. If government cannot give those tower already, uh, already deployed, then we have to work with the NGOs so that from that tower connectivity can be reached to every students. Since we are want to ensure education for our students, this type of survey, this type of financial support, this type of policy dialogue from for the uh, for the industry, telecom industry, and for the government is mandatory to ensure industry for. And we really did it in our university. Next, come to our curricula. What uh, our other panelists have done in the curricula. We have recently updated our curricula. We have proposed what are the industry four related subjects are taught in Princeton University, Stanford University, and very good school in um, Australia, UK. We have studied their syllabus and we have immediately uh, proposed the incorporation of those deep learning courses, robotics courses, and courses related to augmented reality, courses related to cybersecurity to our syllabus. Now coming to the system, how we will do it as a teacher, we are not equipped with it. So that's why we really need to train ourselves. There is no age of learning. So we are actually recommending, inspiring our professors, teachers to listen to a lot of lectures, video lectures and online courses so that we can equip ourselves with that teaching. So my question is why our teachers will do so. So if our universities, our institutes can take those initiatives, then it will be great for us. And if we can get some incentive system that why we will help our university to those door, to do those volunteer jobs. So it is important to give and devise an incentive system for developing curricula, for incorporating uh, these online training courses. So incentives to our faculty is very, very important. And finally, we must invite industry expert to our lectures. This is very important to really remove the gap between industry and academia. Otherwise, those industry people will be always telling the academics are doing writing papers for their promotion only it has no it has no uh, connection with the industry or industry need and our students need to give the real life projects like below ribbon level estimation with a low cost device because otherwise you have to always go to the medical doctors and follow an invasive technique we need to tell our students to write papers, devise project on non-invasive technique of below ribbon level estimation because the pandemic is there and our children are still having jaundice. Thousands of children are having and the neonatal who are having birth, the neonatal jaundice is also there. And it is very risky to do this touching and do the non-invasive invasive way of taking the blood and doing the blue, uh, below ribbon estimation. And think about our senior citizen who are having their uh, blood glucose. So that is also not every, uh, every person in India and every person in Bangladesh is capable of buying a digital glucometer. Our student needs to find out projects that how we can do a non-invasive way of glucose estimation so that our thousands of students can be an entrepreneur and we can transform our project into product. This is very, very important. Every university should have that innovation cell so that our students 
can do real life project and they can see those implemented in their locality and they are not becoming employee, they become the employer. This is very important. Dr. Mohan has talked about elderly because my parents are living from, I'm living in the university campus and my brother and sister-in-law are professor in the United States, but they are living alone. My in-laws are living alone and falling down in the washroom in the kitchen is a common phenomenon. This is very important to give some uh, device to those elderly people so that we can at least avoid the fall protection. So there is, I, I have seen, I am working with some uh, professor in Australia, how they're giving uh, support uh, to the elderly people, not only blood pressure measurement, not only like glucose estimation, to avoid their fall protection so that emergency health can reach to them. And think about our power system. This is one of the major important target in Bangladesh and India, that sustainable energy need, renewable energy, and integration of renewable energy sources to the grid. So we need actually the industry for SCADA implementation. In Bangladesh, we are working with Power Development Board of Bangladesh distribution companies to implement this CADA system. And our students should be involved in those projects and think about the transportation. My grandfather was a lawyer in Kolkata 50 years back and I have seen the transportation scenario of Kolkata and I'm seeing what happens in such a busy city in Dhaka, capital city. So how you can apply your probabilistic and surveillance theory by deep learning to use your, to control your transportation and traffic signal. Since in Dhaka, the green light and red light is there, but still there are manual control of the traffic system. We really need to overcome it so that our uh, traffic police who are very low paid, they get some rest and they get some intelligence level teaching to use so uh, use those smart trafficking system. And now in lockdown, there are a lot of people in the hospital, but the nurses are not going in front of them. They are throwing medicine to the bed. So it is important to tell our students and work on the medical robotics so that those robots can go to those patients and give those medicine to our uh, elderly and affected COVID patients. So this is the way in every class we have projects, but our projects have no contribution, have no solution, have no connection to the societal needs. In this way, we can update ourselves we can update our students. We can respect our industry people. Although we are PhD, they are, many of them are not, but they have their experience. We really need to know what are the skills needed for us and for our students to deploy and to develop a real industry academia collaboration. Lot of joint research, lot of joint collaboration. This is very, very important. Uh, as a, you can, if you say, as a role from academia. And we have to actually, because we are teachers, many people respect us. So we have to take this proactive initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. I think you highlighted very important issues, which are really, uh, we got something in mind. With, we started with the first question. So we are relating that. Uh, we are joined uh, with uh, Professor Chatterjee here. Is that Dr. Chatterjee, Saibal Chatterjee? Yes. Is he there? Yes. Sir, welcome yes. to you. Are you here? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So you are here. So uh, maybe uh, you take time or we can really ask you a question straight away <laughs> because you're involved. No, no, you can ask me straight away. Uh, All right. I'm, face, I'm, I'm pretty sorry to join a little bit late because right. of the time zone right now. So <laughs> uh, you can definitely ask me. I think it is night there, it seems, is it? Uh, it's it's actually 6 a.m. in the morning right now. Right, so it's a morning. So it's a good morning to you, sir. So this is wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank getting, you. We are getting into the evening part of it. So it is a big deal. I know. Uh, so, uh, 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 Dr. Sam, we were talking really about the uh, IR, uh, Industrial Revolution, and the role the academia can play, uh, particularly the faculty, and in terms of the knowledge, the pedagogy that we can use, you know, the type of attitude we should have it, and how really to make it a little effective. 
and uh, we mentioned it that we are industrial revolution 4.0 but our education still remains very traditional and there's a huge gap in what really we are really doing it and how really to cope up with that that is the in fact the question you know we are always having in mind so would you please throw some light as per your experience you got itself yeah professor sure sure yeah. sure sure uh, first of all i just wanted to uh, introduce myself i i am not in i'm not in a, i'm not a professor uh, but i'm in an industry right now uh, I, I work for the food company uh, here in Canada. Uh, it's been almost like this is my twelfth year in Canada since I left India. Uh, now I had a, I had an option of, uh, of studying both in India as well as here. So I can throw some light probably what's happening. Uh, you know what I have been through and what I what I have been here. So there is definitely there is definitely a gap between what we what what is going on right now like the industry 4 plus what india's education system is people like a lot of educated uh, professors are there who have been saying that we are 1.0 uh, it is there is there is a gap definitely the, the the biggest gap is is the digital transformation i would say so for example uh, students in india we are definitely uh, more into reading books uh, you know studying a lot uh, but here it is more about digital transformation so for example here uh, the education system works is uh, the students are exposed to a lot of digital platforms right from the day go uh, and actually it starts from school level uh, and then going into the universities and as they go as they as they go up uh, they they try to use those digital platforms and you know have discussions whether it is whether it is uh, talking to the industries is through the digital platform uh, getting exposed to uh, doing business games with the industries over the over the digital platform so these are the exposures uh, so what happens is today's in today's industries uh, as we know we are in a very tough situation right now both the both the all over the world it's a pandemic situation what this pandemic has is teaching us is that we need to change ourselves and we need to change ourselves and adapt to situations very fast the world is moving into a very fast digital space uh, digital revolution is happening everywhere whether it is healthcare system uh, i'm talking about context here in in the western countries uh, digital is happening in the healthcare system digital is happening in the industries digital is happening in the marketing field sales supply chain everywhere say for example in my in the companies which i'm working right now we are a consumer goods company and we we sell products to different big chains like walmarts and sobeys and costcos and you know you have big chains uh, so uh, when a product is sold from a store level uh, so when a cashier scans a product that 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 ping of the of the product that scan of the products goes to the warehouse of the of the company it goes to the manufacturer also so it comes to us so for example we sitting in our office in our system we can see one particular store has sold one product and we can and same intimation same scanning uh, intimation goes to the production as well as the manufacturing also so this is the kind of digital transformation which is happening right now so never the product the stores or the companies out of product so every time we know that what what product has been sold so this is the kind of so from from my, my 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 professional background what i can say to the students is is they should not be limiting themselves to you know one particular area for example a student specializing in hr they should be learning all the all the areas of marketing hr supply chain everything because today the world is moving in a very fast pace and when the students come to the industries uh, you know Uh, first of all the the recruitment the hiring the talent management will be very much changing from here onwards so people will be looking multitasking people so for example if i am been hired as an hr i should be able to move or have an option to move into the company in, in, in the later future as a marketing so i should be knowing all the backgrounds so the exposure of education here in india is we have specialized and when the when the students specializes they want to stay in the same group i would say that they should come out of that group they should interact with different industries different their own and this will only help not only themselves but also the growth of the industries and this is where the role of academia comes probably uh, i might be uh, i might be wrong there might be so many professors who can give more lights 
that you know they should not be fixed and strict to one particular segment they should be exposed to all the areas you know for example marketing we should know should know a little bit of hr and they should also practice hr or hr should be marketing because the world the way it is moving right now uh, you know there will be very less people doing you know lots of work and you need a lot of multitasking people to do a lot of things uh, it's basically you know managing yourself managing remotely how to manage remotely so probably these are the things you know i would say uh, i can highlight so that's all i have from me my my side oh thank you very much dr chatterjee in fact very nice i stand corrected you are you are from the industry and uh, it is all the more important for us to listen to what you really said it and you made very important points in fact for the academic world that's what was there now i thank I you very much right i, I mean uh, uh, i got very interesting part i was looking at what the word academia means and what it consists of and it refers to also students the staff the ecosystem and everything which was there because uh, earlier we were using academia means only faculty or as an institution right uh, and, and my understanding i mean generally being used so i was looking at what type of students we should have it and uh, the type of students we have in india i'm sure you all know it we were the students how we were doing it what is the type of students we got here and what sort of i think we should do uh, so that you know students should have that sorry which they are ready for uh, industrial revolution 4.0 including the staff is not merely because i as a faculty i'm okay i mean i'm using now i didn't use zoom i'm using i'm using i didn't use uh, meet teach team okay i'm now comfortable i teach from there how about the staff and likewise the whole ecosystem which i've got it you know uh, which refers to dr shanas refers to the uh, digital infra infrastructure and all those things which are there so uh, those are issues which are there so firstly students uh, how do you look at it uh, Uh, Dr. Kole, how do you look at it? Yeah, you understand. You know, we are from the academic world. We are ready as a faculty. Let me assure you, in India, most of us we are ready. You know, academic world to face the challenges we got in the Industrial Revolution 4.0, digitization, and all those. You know, what you mentioned. We may not be having nine pillars in our courses, but at the few pillars, definitely we have it. Because depending upon the context, the students, how to upgrade them? Now that is the question. I mean, it's it is really a very good uh, question, and uh, I know that we have a lot of challenges also. And uh, to address these challenges, basically we have to move uh, in a very systematic way. We have to see that in which we have the strength, and how that strength we have to in integrate with reference to the advancement of technologies, and uh, based on that, how. Uh, we can change our curriculum how we can implement education learning platforms and how we can integrate the students the teachers and how we can become the lifelong learner also in a very systematic way right and for that we need to uh, we need the support especially from the government also uh, or maybe developing appropriate uh, timely policies okay rather than having too much uh, bureaucratic approach also so and uh, i mean basically only the education institutes or the individuals they cannot contribute uh, towards the let's say academia core or education core we need a very integrated support from policy makers from industries and from educational institutions also and of course from individual also to adopt the technology and Make the changes in the curriculum and also to make ourselves as a lifelong learner also. Mm. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Any other views, please? Yeah. Doctor Ganguly, Doctor Sanjay. Any one of you? How do you look at the whole the quality of students that we got it right? i mean we talk about student centric learning process but they still depend upon dr sanjay lecture hona chahiye sir this is important we are not able to get right student centric means they have to do more work rather than i mean we will only be uh, mentoring right uh, there's a process we provide all support we are ready to be mentoring them but this is not happening 
Uh, Professor Sarma, uh, this is Abhijit here. Uh, actually, yeah. uh, what I meant to say is more centric, uh, is not the centricity per se, but it is more of a student led It's more of a student led kind of a learning need to happen because otherwise, you know, it, it, you go back to industry one kind of a education practice where, uh, where normally the teaching used to be a monologue, but now it has to be multilogue. So we need to ensure that the students' participation in the classroom is on the highest level uh, through the various activities, real-time learning, okay? And uh, making them exposed to the real world challenges and giving them the options to find the solutions for it. So I think, I think there are various way we can, or ways we can um, uh, help them to learn the techniques. Or, or to to learn the 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 kind of skills they need to transition themselves to the industry in a responsible manner, okay, which will not only help them to contribute to the industry but to the society at large, and can bring out the, the fact which is very important, is that uh, that the education's contributions to the society, you know, that's very important. So it comes from the success of the students whom we are, uh, you know, churning out on a daily basis from the industry. I would say like churning out the world, but it's, it's like a product of the university. So if you want to put a stamp on them, being an accredited school, as we call it in North America, so being that kind of thing, responsibility, that is because he, he comes from that school. So he, 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 you know, he is a sought after kind of a guy and, and, and the recruitment flows. So these are the thing, but one of the things which I would like to uh, bring to the panel is uh, one of the thing baffling me rather in, when I see India from outside, uh, we have never seen the mushrooming, mushroom kind of a ranking process of business schools, what we see in India. Uh, so it is, it is more of a money-making machine rather than real-time education. So the challenge before the government of India is to make the transitions or to bring the system or the governance in such a way with the integration of technology digitalizations or what do you call it? As the prime minister is saying, your prime minister is saying that uh, Atanirbar Bharat. Now Atanirbar Bharat will not only come from the slogan, but comes from the tangible contributions and the policy, including the governance system of the country as they progress. Because this is what, uh, you know, this seminar will be incomplete if we don't touch on the kind of responsibility academia or intelligent militia of the country is having towards bringing a revolutions of education for in alignment with industry for requirements. So this is my take on this subject. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ganguly. Dr. No, Sharma, I, I, yeah, I sure. Add add three yeah, points. Points. Basically, the institute and the universities has to upgrade their infrastructure. That is one point. Second is, uh, you know, there should be a good partnership or relationship between the academia and the industry. So as, as uh, Saibal has highlighted that it is in India typically more on theory and less on practical approach. So once you have the, uh, you know, kind of uh, partnership with the industry, there would be, you know, hands-on uh, experience. Students would be exposed to what, what is going on in the industry, what is the latest, uh, uh, in, you know, technology being adopted. And at the same time, they would get the, get the practical training also. So more on training in the industry, a project should be towards oriented towards the industry and the uh, and, and, uh, uh, project should be based on some problems, uh, current problems in hand and then how the students apply their mind to resolve those. And at the same time, uh, there should be uh, some change in the mindset also from both the students as well as the teaching staff. The, the, there should be no, like, people, uh, the students should not be running behind to just pass the exams, you know, basically, they should be more focusing on the projects, they should be more focusing on getting the practical training and uh, sincerely attempting that, that is going to pay uh, them when they, they join the industry. So that's what my take, thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sanjay. Wonderful. Change in the mindset is what really we look for. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, doc, uh, Dr. Salia. Uh, sir, only, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Only to inform you that Dr. Indranil Bose has joined. Okay, uh, he's there. So maybe after him, I think we, we welcome him. I think he's here. So we have requested Dr. Salia Shahnaj uh, for her views. Thank you. Thank you. It is very important for us, uh, you know, uh, that uh, uh, usually we go to the conferences, uh, we go to the industry when we need sponsorship for arranging conferences, supporting our venues, to throw a big dinner, to have a very good uh, registration kit. So that's the majority of the cases, our relationship with the industry. But, you know, and, uh, and our methodology, we have a lot of PhD scholars, masters, students, and our way of research is just uh, Google in the uh, website, to go to IEEE Explore, see the journals and see the topic. So that's the way we are moving in India, Bangladesh. Although we have a lot of talented researchers and hard workers, what is important, we really need to take problem from the industry. And we have to give confidence to the industry that we can solve it with our students. And while solving those industry problem, then we will use our deep learning techniques because deep learning is such a tool. It's not only for computer science. It can be used in business. It can be used in power. It can be used in ICT, healthcare, anywhere. So getting a problem from the industry is very, very important. That's why our university need an industry innovation cell who will do those liaison. And secondly, we need to involve our students for the internship so that our students who are usually doing a lot of tuitions uh, to support them and to support their family. If they can do internship, they can write it in their CV and they can know the current trends going on in the industry. So these are the two ways our industry and we can have, um, we can actually um, solve the problem of the industry. At the same time, we can involve our students in those industry and it will in the long run benefit our students because they can clearly see their recruitment path. And after passing, they will not ask me, Madam, do you know any uh, company where I can go? And do you, can, can you recommend me for doing the, uh, doing uh, to go to any company? Can you talk with some CEOs? So they will not ask it they will clearly understand that who, what will be their recruitment path and where they will go. And uh, finally, what we really need that we have to always uh, have a joint co-authorship with our industry expert. This is very, very important. Then they feel committed. Lot of industry people are working in the industry and they are doing a lot of contribution and they are not thinking that it is good enough to publish it in, in the papers. This is our academia whom, and it is our job to give them confidence that they are doing a good job and we can reshape their uh, writing and contribution in the, in, the, in the papers so that their contribution can be archived. So if they can see that their contributions are also archived the way we are our archiving our journals, then they will feel more obligation to support us. And, and it's important uh, to, uh, to take funding for them to create computational facility like GPU. Our universities cannot buy all the computational facilities all the time. And we can, uh, take their funding to buy those GPUs and write their name, company name. Sometimes in subcontinent, we want to take fund, but we don't want to recognize somebody's name. That is very important. So we have to write their name. We have academic council. We have a lot of uh, department meetings. And after the meeting, we decide that, oh, name, no uh, name cannot be there. 
So these are the perception we have to overcome to recognize those people. And we have a social perception. What is that? If you work in the industry, then you may not be, you may not have a good marriage. Everybody thinks that the best students are coming for the university are becoming the professors. So we have to also tell our students that if you don't like teaching, you can go to the inter industry and you can be social entrepreneur. Not necessarily all the all high school dropout will be the social entrepreneurs. If we can inspire our students to be social entrepreneurs, in the long run, it will ensure our funding. And the whole interest can be generated if we can change our question pattern, not memorizing. Our question patterns will be critical problem solving, take home exam type. That will create those interests because it is not always possible to answer our question types in three hours exam. So for those critical question setting as an academician, we have to give more time to our question setting so don't we don't repeat the questions that depend on the memorization they it it should be very inquisitive thank you very much thank you very much dr shena in fact you really touched very important point we are facing and we really practice also as an academia so uh, we are in fact got uh, dr indranil bose uh, we extend a very hearty welcome to you sir um, we are starting around that time and uh, now we are on the last leg in a way for a discussion relating to the role of academia uh, and uh, in the context of the industrial revolution 4.0 uh, but certainly we would like to listen to you as to what is that you feel about the role because the faculty the students the curriculum the knowledge and skills and the attitude the whole lot of things because that type of things your view sir okay i have uh, i think i am audible good evening everybody uh, Actually, I joined late because I had a meeting. Uh, now, uh, see, uh, there are three things uh, what we do in our university. I'll share my experience. Uh, first of all, we I am working with the University of Bolton at their international campus at UAE. And uh, uh, see, uh, we have uh, 21 campuses across the globe, uh, apart from UK main campus. Uh, so we are the only one in the Middle East. Uh, so we, what we do actually, University of Bolton and many other universities in UK, what they're doing presently, they are looking for uh, paperless university practice, paperless, that's the most important thing. Our university is looking for paperless practices in the university. So not only from now, I mean, I am seeing it is from since 2014. And in the paperless university, we are uh, taking the exams uh, in a particular platform. Uh, it is, uh, uh, then we are uh, assignment based, where assessment is something different. And it is not exactly the examination pattern what we know in India, like 100 marks exam, nothing like that. We have the merit distinction and other things. Uh, and uh, apart from that, all our faculty members, staff members, teaching uh, teaching staff members, uh, technical support team, uh, do we work uh, in a very coordinated way uh, so that everything can be conducted uh, on the certain platforms. And uh, apart from that, what I'm talking about the skill side, the skill side is uh, uh, say uh, when we are taking the classes in the classrooms also and also in the blended mode also what we are doing presently. Uh, so in all these cases, uh, there are certain kind of specific skill requirements because I see sometimes my friends in India or many other places, uh, they feel not comfortable in taking the classes online and they say this is not happening and something like that. I definitely require something to uh, empower them. I mean, how to take the classes, specialized, specialized training programs or uh, staff development programs can be done. And uh, the third one is the mapping program. The mapping one, I am telling you because many of you are talking about the uh, 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 students are not getting placements or the jobs and how to make these things. Uh, most of the UK universities, at least our programs, I've seen the Middlesex University, I've seen the Harriet Watt, I've seen the British University Dubai. What we do actually map our courses uh, according to the requirements of the professional bodies of the UK. Like uh, when you teach our, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, bachelor's degree program or the MBA programs, uh, say that when you're teaching the human resource curriculum, so we map the uh, curriculum according to CIPD uh, curriculum. So that uh, when the students are going for job, uh, the CIPD curriculum is very much uh, up to date, you know, all of you. 
Uh, so that is actually industry ready. When your students go for the job and other things, I mean, uh, or they go for the CIPD uh, the certifications or fellowship or anything like that. So uh, they get the, uh, I mean, many papers exemption or many points exemption, something like that. Same like that when they go for the CIA marketing courses and they go for the CIA, CIM courses, I mean, we map our courses like this. And this is not only done by us, it is done from our university. And uh, also when we are having the uh, curriculum, I mean, the courses and the uh, programs offered across different countries. Now outside UAE, we have many, uh, we, have, we have the campus in Africa and Ghana. We have in Malaysia, we have in China, we have in Hong Kong, I mean, uh, many places in, in Germany. Okay. So every country we are trying, we try to uh, make our courses mapped as much, as, as much as possible in of the certifying bodies of that country. And say somebody wants to study in the, in the area of marketing or the finance, and we make it uh, mapped with the WCSB, ACCA, or other things like this. And so this is the way we try to make our students more employable. We try to give the input, which is uh, more industry ready. Okay, and uh, we have uh, our MBA program is more uh, uh, not mainly focused on the textbooks. We mostly develop our curriculum, our assignments, our teaching plans, and everything uh, according to uh, the professional uh, industry reports. Okay, we said just now I was taking actually the class with uh, our one of the campuses here. I'm adjunct faculty of IMT Dubai also. So they also do the programs also same like that. See, uh, I have seen in UK curriculum also something like they uh, in the PGPX program or MBA programs or even bachelor's degree programs, half of the curriculum, half of the teaching deliveries are based on industry reports, not only like uh, say when I was talking about uh, say the human resource management or innovation and management and all these things. So a lot of reports are available, like Price or Rose Cooper's reports or uh, McKinsey reports and all these things are reports. Many reports are freely available online. Okay, and some reports university purchases. So uh, this kind of thing can be done so that the students can have a uh, very up-to-date report and up-to-date information about what is happening. And about the collaboration and the outreach program, uh, see, that is very important because uh, we are the branch campus. So uh, we are uh, allowed to outreach up to certain geographies, not beyond that. So we can uh, collaborate with the students from Africa or the students from Eastern Europe with the students from Southeast Asia, with the students from uh, East Asia and this part. So we, we do the outreach programs according to the requirement of our university, of our campus, because every campus has their allotted course plans and allotted course offering. So accordingly we do it. Uh, so that uh, like recently we have done some kind of collaboration of the with the, some universities in India, uh, mainly the South India. So uh, see regarding the artificial intelligence, automation and something like that. So I'm telling this is the way we are making it and uh, think will be better in future. Definitely some challenges are there, uh, but uh, uh, the entire thing will be changing. And uh, not only the management field, I'm telling every field should be like this. And uh, the paper, I am mainly focusing on the paperless university concept because it is not only the sustainable goal of the entire UK and uh, many of the universities they have now uh, as per the uh, OFQL regulation and the teaching excellence framework, TEF uh, framework guidelines. So they are making it that uh, this much of work you have to do on the without paper and something like that. So accordingly, they're making it the platinum grade university or gold rate or a silver rating, something like that. Uh, so that is very important. And in many of the Indian universities are doing, I'm saying I can name the name, some of the universities like Ashoka University is doing, Oxen University, Hyderabad, they're doing. So they're also focusing on these things in India because we are their partners in some courses and some curriculum. And uh, so a lot of things are happening in India. I mean, many people staying outside, they don't know about India. They always about the bad mouth about India. I'm not about that. I am very aware about that, what is happening in India. Uh, so, uh, better things are happening also happening in India. India is a hub of you know, innovation. We know it very well. And uh, presently, uh, we are entering into collaboration with some Israel Innovation Institute with uh, some universities in India and uh, University of Bolton uh, in UK. And we are developing some curriculum for the students of the Asia and the Central Asia I and mean, Middle East. That is regarding about uh, uh, critical thinking, system thinking, innovation and other things. And, uh, you know, Israel is known for this all these things. So we have to find out which particular institute, which particular country, they are very liberal in extending the supports. Not every country because uh, cannot do it because many universities are eager to do these kind of things, but their country's regulation, their government policies might not be supportive. So we have to be very careful about that. And definitely a proper strategic planning can be done. I mean, this is the way and we can do it a lot of things. Thank you, sir.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Indranil Bose. It's wonderful. In fact, you really summed up. We were in, as I said, we were in the last leg of this session. Uh, we got a few questions. In fact, one or two, I think we'll take them up. And um, some of the questions, of course, relate to what you mentioned. But I think there is always a curiosity in the minds of the audience as to how we should try to proceed and go for it. For example, uh, one question is that what impact will have on the Indian financial system uh, when we try to go for industrial revolution, particularly the blockchain technology and those technology we are mentioning about it, how really we should go about it, what impact it's going to have it. So views, uh, Dr. Kohle, it was of course referred to you, but I think anyone can really answer it. Dr. Kohle to begin with. So Dr. Rakam, uh, before somebody answer your question, uh, I have to say to you, I have some family commitment, this is Sanjay Jain. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rakam and Dr. Swati. Thank you. Oh, Dr. Sanjay, you are, I'm sorry, I couldn't get you. I have to leave uh, due to oh. family commitment. So All thank right, you very much. So nice of you, Dr. Uh, Sanjay. In fact, it has been a wonderful impact what you mentioned. I was to summarize later on, but I think your contribution has been very, very, very enriching. So nice of you and sparing time. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank thank you very you much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We'll stay in touch, right? Thank you. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, Dr. Kohle. <laughs> sir. Uh, Indian financial system and the uh, uh, impact on that. Uh, you mentioned about... It seems cyber there is a, some network issue oh. uh, because uh, I, what I have seen that couple of times, it is getting uh, restarted again, the Jew. Okay. Me, with me. I hope uh, Dr. Kole, this is with me, I believe. <clears throat> And uh, this is what I think uh, Dr. Uh, Sanjay... Uh, your voice is coming in very packet mode, very okay. not in continuous mode. All right. All right. Uh, so I hope the question is, I, uh, I'm able to communicate. Is that all right? Yeah, now it is coming okay. Yeah. Right, sir. Right, sir. So your response, sir. Your response. I think now again, I, it seems like uh, I lost you. Okay. Uh, the question was from the audience. Uh, they were asking Industrial Revolution 4.0, if we adopt in the Indian financial system, uh, what going to the impact? How do really we go about it? Particularly when you use the blockchain technology, etc., which is being there. Sir, you mentioned about yes. cyber. Yes, uh, for that Correct. For that question, uh, I have answered in the chat box also, but okay. uh, here I will give you one example. Yeah. So blockchain technology can be used in uh, many ways. And I believe that that question was related that how the blockchain technologies can impact the financial models or the financial issues with reference to the India. So I have given one example that blockchain technologies, if we are going to implement in the energy system, for example. So let's say we have many distributed generators and distributed generators are going to be operate based on the blockchain technology within the distributed network. So based on that, the local generators or operators of those generators can get the revenue based on that. So similarly, such type of technologies or the blockchain technologies can be integrated or implemented in other sectors also. I think I'm not able to hear anything. It seems like a, maybe my connection or somewhere the connection is not getting. Yeah, it seems so, there was so a yeah, connection issue, connection issue. And um, I think I'm stationed at Delhi and uh, normally it doesn't go. You can now decide as to what digital divide we are having it. <laughs> All right. So uh, next is, of course, that the last probably we'll have it. Um, uh, I think it's a very general sort of a question. Um, uh, how to make students business savvy? I think, uh, you know, in the developed world, I think USA, Canada, you can think in terms of, I mean, they themselves are there. 
maybe one of the reasons are they are experienced people maybe they are whatever i mean i don't know but then uh, our students we they are not business savvy one part is mentioned of course uh, uh, was very interesting that we should not make them uh, functional oriented student uh, this one part we should always be trying to make them business savvy in our courses also so this was one but how do you sir, respond to it uh, yeah professor uh, uh, shenaj how do you look at or uh, professor yeah you, you can you can i think i can take the I, yeah sure. i can take the question uh, since it's on the business front uh, right. so the so the, so there's two fronts to this one is uh, from academic point of view i would say uh, they should be more focused in number one networking 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 with in in the networking platform with different business individuals from academic point of view they should be also doing a lot of business games so business games is basically they should be working in groups i am not sure about how the curriculum structure is right now uh, in the management or mba program but here in this country what we have is uh, the way the curriculum works is uh, we have individual marks individual individual assignments which contributes say about 10% of the of the of the course marks but the bulk of the marks con consists of of group work so within the group work everyone has to contribute so how they contribute they have a group group contract which they need to sign and they sign the contract and then they do a group work on the group work it is mostly business games so business games is basically they they take ex industry examples they need to go to the websites they need to find out their financial uh, financial reports they need to find out what the what the marketing plan is and they need to get come up with a presentation or a a, a, a a total total program about how to how to go about a business solution from industry point of view uh, what they should be doing is they again you know as i told before that uh, they should be learning all the aspects not only they should be restricted to hr or marketing they should be going through all the all the programs because they need to be more multitasking Uh, in this in this in scenario and going forward you know one is to get formalized with the digital world second is to get get more multitasking about how to go about in different businesses and they should not be restricting themselves so this is the two areas i would i can i can think of you know in a in a, in a nutshell thanks thank you very much dr chatterjee uh, uh, dr boss how do you look at or uh, then um, maybe uh, um, okay sir uh, just yes, there is a saying that uh, own nothing but control everything so that is a known when i mean uh, present business uh, i mean business tycoons are coming like if you talk about the uber the uber does not uh, have the uh, the taxis but they control everything like facebook they don't have anything but they have to control all the data so the point is that see be very smart and everything is now young generation uh, uh, i mean all the answers lying with uh, i think innovation creativity and everything and many of the business schools and universities now are creating incubation centers that is definitely a, a big uh, development towards uh, encouraging the students and uh, to become entrepreneur at their level and because there are certain uh, mental blocks uh, why the uh, i mean mainly the middle class people and the people from different backgrounds they think that businessmen is investing a lot of money and from where they will get it uh, if we take the loan also from the government or the financial institutions and we fail in the business so we will pay back these things so the point is that see that particular mental block and that particular uh, apprehension must be uh, uh, looked after and how to overcome those things psychological barrier i can should say so this is the way different things can be done sir and uh, uh, many of the universities i know the, in india also abroad also uh, they create the intellectual uh, investments and uh, or the uh, this kind of thing in their innovation center and uh, they ask their students to uh, uh, do the simulation practices for the developing the business ideas and all those things mainly uh, with the new technologies new platforms and other things so business possibilities are huge we we teach the case studies in the business schools about the entrepreneurship innovation and definitely we should encourage them to learn from the different practices like uh, now uh, say oyo hotels and other things are there are plenty examples of uh, are available so encouraging examples where without investing much money how they have developed the business and only thing this thing uh, so uh, opportunities are there and we have to create in the mindset encouraging them 
because uh, not only if you just uh, go to the classrooms and teach about what is entrepreneurship what is uh, why what actually has been done by uh, some ambanis or bidlas or tatas they are always already rich people rich people i mean people will not uh, take those things in their heart so how we can talk about the young generation entrepreneurs how they have started uh, i can discuss 100 examples here in the here itself but i not do uh, so like this kind of things can be done and entrepreneurship uh, today's entrepreneurship is definitely at par with the new generation new requirement new business uh, outcomes and say a lot of hotel booking websites have come up a lot of uh, travel booking websites have come up a uh, lot of new ideas are coming up actually and how uh, by these things to to the digital platforms how the things can be done but definitely definitely the changes are happening more and more people are becoming entrepreneur now uh, in many business schools and many places different clubs are being set up entrepreneurship clubs have been set up in our campus we have one with the engineering and winter we send the students for competitions and uh, i mean other things to the other gulf countries they come up with the ideas and come up with the awards and everything so we create also some funds i mean seed funds for their investment small fund not that much we also encourage the students uh, to participate in the funded projects of the uh, bodies here like that we have the rasal khaima investment authority of rasal khaima government in dubai also a lot of uh, dubai government seed fund is there all the universities they take it and they allow allow their students to join certain programs uh, presently dubai expo has been declared last year and it is postponed to uh, next year because of the covid and every university has played important role india has a very big pavilion in there and dubai expo you can look at the emirates flight you will see the dubai expo is written there and uh, so how we are doing this kind of thing means uh, this particular things because it is uh, helping us to make it as a knowledge economy entrepreneurship is there without that we cannot make it and the overall ecosystem must be developed accordingly i mean only one university cannot do it and uh, so that's the main thing i can say thank, thank you sir. very much dr bhavas and dr ganguly how do you feel about it uh, just a very quick bite uh, i think much of the much of the answer has been said by saibal and and indranil both but the thing is this that uh, you know the in order to make the business savvy it's it's it it not just uh, one or two prescriptions you can prescribe it's a holistic efforts that an organization need to give and as i said in my earlier discussions that curriculum plays a very big role in terms of bringing that particular changes okay to make them business savvy so they have to be more and more practical oriented application oriented teaching so where they can they can have a business game simulations entrepreneurship uh, camp industry visit okay then then the case based teaching uh, and then then the flip teaching all those kind of things is going to contribute to them uh, towards making more and more biz towards developing more and more business senses and once they develop that particular thing they can bring that that kind of flavor or that that's that's their understanding into the uh in, in, in into their presentations or or in their career as and when they progress towards the job so that's what is my take oh thank you very much and last word dr shanaj is your side how do you look at it thank you for all the contributions and great comments and that has enriched not only you also myself what i need to do or what i recommend that is uh, that we need to as an engineer as a business people we really need to know how to write a project proposal with financial proposal in the financial proposal it does not need to be only income and expenses there should be some business model business model with risk analysis business model that how those that proposal will be scalable if it is for one part of india how it can be implemented anywhere in india or any part of the world having similar problem so how to make that model sustainable that means if the funding is over then how we can run it with the surplus it is important to know that how we are running a project how we will manage the finances with limited fund because we cannot just express that we will be always fund getting fund until it is needed so we have to really know 
how with our project funded project we have to generate revenue and how to do those maintenance like when you are buying the security camera for our peep our our university surveillance so we cannot just depend on that other people will come and come for maintenance here is the scope of improving and training our academic and lab staff for those maintenance in the way uh, our uh, their skill the staff skill will be improved at the same time we do not need to bring other people and buy a huge money for those maintenance and important to involve our students with seminars because now it is lockdown lot of conferences lot of international project competition so that they can meet up with the sponsors industry expert entrepreneurs can know about their success stories not looking at the business tycoon in our countries what um, cyber uh, what inonil has said and important to involve them with international organization like ieee i i i am involved with ieee that is the largest technical and professional organization in the world for electrical engineers business people are there sociology people are there that will give them a bigger look that how to think out of the box then those students will be uh coming up with uh, the new idea and break the social barrier of becoming and embracing uh, becoming entrepreneurs and becoming uh, becoming our collaborators our students to become collaborate that's happening in california they are actually sending their students to industry and those industry are sending problem to the academia and is this a loop and it's a collaboration and in the long run our academician are um, investing in the industry so that culture has to be developed so that we can understand it is not a risky job even if it is a risky job we need to find out the avenues how to overcome those risk this is very important this risk analysis and finding the mitigation plan for every risk in our academic project but we have a limited time we have a limited salary to write those proposal we need to apply to our government for our incentive grant so that we can equip ourselves with the research equipment we can train our staff we can give our students funding for those things and in the long run there should be no problem of money there will be the, our government like turkey government they are bringing all their scholars remaining in the north america to improve their research and innovation so we can always collaborate with our scholars in india who are living in uk who are living in united states australia and canada to come up with the good practices we have to follow the good practices and it has to be practiced in each level starting from the leadership the way you are doing um, dr ratan sharma it is important for the leadership to understand the need of uh, becoming a takey person and if he or she is not confident about embracing those technology in our culture we may not feel to tell our juniors to help us even our juniors who are low paid they will not feel comfortable because they will not get recognition for the leadership we will not tell what this project has been led by this junior so this type of collaboration and this type of mindset change should be brought to the leadership level so that um uh, so that uh, so that uh, they can feel encouraged to involve the juniors to implement those visions at the same time we as a mentor should take care that our mentees are getting recognized so that the whole pyramid is works uh, pyramid works properly and the chain become complete and cycle become more productive thank you oh thank you very much i don't know how really to thank you all 
uh, I must say that it has been a very enriching session. Uh, maybe I take a few minutes really to just refresh our audience what really we talked about. Uh, we started very interesting question about the society role of the uh, I, uh, IRR and impact on the society and then went down to the role of the academia. And uh, I think it has been a very interesting part which has been played by uh, Dr. Kohli to begin with. He started with the uh, what we refer to the cyber physical system which is to be adopted. Later on, he made presentation and said, hey, look here, these are the type of technology we need really to get into and solve some of the problems facing the society. I think it has been a very wonderful, uh, Dr. Kohli. It's a really nice that you really made us really a uh, very important contribution in terms of the curriculum, the pedagogy that we should be trying really to go for it. Uh, Dr. Ganguly, in fact, it has been very nice when we started with very interesting part of the, uh, what we refer to, we should give return, something return to the society when we talked about it. Because otherwise, if we don't give a return with societal needs, we don't really uh, solve the problems of the society. And there's no return to the society. Ultimately, we are a part of it. You mentioned that, and later on, you mentioned very interesting part we are facing. In fact, of what we really we should be doing about, for example, uh, the the challenges that we are having it, uh, these type of thing, mushroom growth of ranking. You mentioned the success of the students. You mentioned, and uh, you suggested system of governance. In fact, in the system, we should have it. I think that is a very important part you mentioned. You also mentioned student centric centric learning process. And where is the role of the teachers and others? I think that bound to really change and get into that part. I think it's wonderful, Dr. Ganguly. In fact, you made a very important point. How really we can have a transition from uh, uh, whatever uh, IR we got it, two, four, one. Because there has been uh, in certain section of India, uh, uh, maybe IR two or three, and then getting the IR four. I mean, that sort of a thing which is happening. But it has been a very interesting contribution you made. Dr. Sanjay Jain has been very nice. In fact, he mentioned about the practical lab system and also said a learning factory which should be adopted. We are so nice of you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are also thankful to uh, Dr. Uh, Shalia Shanaj. In fact, uh, coming from Bangladesh, you mentioned he said what really we face the same thing. Uh, similar situation involve industry lectures, which is what should be there, project should be. And you mentioned interesting part from project to product innovation, you should get into that. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good phrase, I must say. You used it because we give a lot of projects to the students, but can this be made a product? And it can be for the CSR context also, so that you know some of the societal issues or problems can be sorted and uh, can be, uh, the problems can be sorted out. Industry collaboration is required. You mentioned about those issues, how really we can have it. And you mentioned about the practical issue, we do it, in the, we do it, in fact. We, 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 we approach the industry for our sponsorship and we talk about exhibition, we talk about when we need them. But at the same time, industry also, you know, I think, are they that open? In fact, I was uh, uh, of, of this opinion that industry is also not forthcoming to that extent. Those slight change now is not forthcoming. Uh, we can't really blame only the academic uh, world, also that people. They feel it, oh, it's all right, they are all theoretical. We are shifting from theory to practice, in fact. We are trying to adapt that. Please help us out. Unless they help us out, is a vicious circle. We will remain where we are. We are remain in that well. So that is a very important thing. And ma'am, really nice. You really made this. And uh, then we have uh, Dr. Chatterjee coming. And Dr. Chatterjee, in fact, you mentioned about a uh, very important point of uh, the, you coming from the food company. Uh, the, there's a gap in the education. We mentioned is education one uh, and uh, industrial revolution four. And uh, they said very imp important part that let's not limit ourselves to one functional area. Uh, and of course, he gave an example, HR, it applies to anybody for that matter. We should try really to understand the business per se. And if there were business per se, even whether engineering or system or IT for that matter, ultimately we are trying to help the business to improve the practices and be profitable. So if we understand the business, probably then probably it will be of really help us. So we really get into that part. Uh, and thank you very much, sir, Dr. Chatterjee. In fact, very nicely, you really summed up and mentioned. Uh, Dr. Bose, it was really nice when you mentioned about, because you also teach in the, those areas or subjects which you mentioned about mapping the courses with industry requirements. Some of us do sometimes. I will not say every time, but some of us do definitely. 
and uh, uh, um, we are able to upgrade our services. How, as I, as I was mentioning in the beginning, uh, there is a gap between what we teach and what the industry look for. We are trying to bridge it, trying to map it as the industry looks for it. But the changes are so fast. The nature of changes are so much that it's very difficult to cope up with those changes, you know. But it's a challenge, and that is what we are faced with. So it doesn't matter. Uh, we are on this. Uh, we are trying to get into that. We are really nice that you know, um, everybody has really contributed uh, very nicely. In fact, in this uh, in this case, I don't know how really to thank you all, uh, sparing time and enriching us. At least I feel enriched. I'm sure the audience also feel that way. I think the type of questions they are writing and they are the type of comments they are really making it. It has been a very wonderful session as to what role we as a faculty and what type of things we can do for the students and what sort of industry uh, collaboration we can have it and also the role in government has to play. Thank you once again. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, over to you, Swati. I think from my side, so nice of you. I don't know how really to say uh, thanks because it has been to me a very wonderful and enriching session that I had it with such an enlightened speakers with me coming from different walks of life, mostly from industry and then the uh, academia and relating and integrating it. Thank you very much for this. Thanks a lot. Over to you. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful way of conducting the session as expert you are. Uh, thank you each and every one of the dignitaries for your wonderful insights and the uh, deeper as they are right from your observations and experiences. And I'm sure as the takeaways are many, we, uh, the faculty as well as the students are going to learn them and implement them in our own ways. As we mark the close of the day's event, let me request my teammate, Professor Bishuruk Chatterjee, who had been working hard in the making of this event to propose a vote of thanks, which would be followed by the national anthem. With this, I take your leave and pass on the close of the event to Professor Bishuruk Chatterjee. Keep well. Thank you. Thank you, Swati, ma'am. So before I begin with my vote of thanks, uh, I would like to... Uh, very briefly, I'd like to state my take on and my takeaways from this session, if you allow me, uh, just for a few seconds. Uh, we have started from the societal accommodation of modern academia, and we have reached till the paperless university practice. So what a wonderful webinar uh, it could have been, and it, it is. And much emphasis have been uh, given on this uh, uh, using the technology or through technology, how we can return back to the society on the contrary of mindless operations and how we can contribute to the farming even in uh, during the pandemic or post pandemic. Even uh, Dr. Shahnaz has introduced a concept called disinfection robots, primarily used in Singapore, for example, and how you know this this kind of innovation we can adopt uh, in the, in the in the emerging countries. So Dr. Kole has rightly said about the traditional engineering towards cyber physical system and how, you know, for example, home energy management system. So these are some of the few very, very good examples, very, very good concepts we can, uh, we really, uh, uh, it has been emerged from this uh, uh, webinar. And I think uh, as a team member, as a committee member, uh, I propose it as a very successful webinar. Uh, and I, I hope all you are uh, agree with this. Uh, fact. So, yeah, that's valid. Yeah. So, definitely, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, give us uh, heartful thanks to Dr. G.B. Subramaniam and uh, Dr. Professor Patro, who has been the guiding light for all this uh, throughout this webinar and the conduction, operation, management, uh, planning, everything. Then my sincere thanks goes to Mr. M. Venkateshulu from AIMS and Mr. Sunil Joshi, who has been an instant support and guidance to us for this uh, organizing this webinar in the planning phase also till the implementation. And we'd like to thank uh, Dr. Sujata Mangaraj, the president of AIMS, to be there uh, for our wonderful um, motivational words, uh, followed by Professor R.C. Bhattacharya. He has been a pillar in you know, all these AIMS webinars and plannings in the Eastern region. We have been already uh, always guided by sir. Thank you, sir. And later on, I'd like to thank on uh, my all the you know, uh, esteemed speakers, uh, right from Dr. Mohun Lal Kole, Dr. Indalil Bose, Dr. Obhijit Ganguly, Mr. Shoibal Chatterjee, uh, Dr. Uh, Shalina Sahnaj, and uh, please pardon me uh, if I 
if i uh, forget sanjay jain sanjay uh, jain dr sanjay jain so this is something uh, we'd like to thank and uh, after all uh, professor ratan sharma uh, uh, how much thank i can give him i don't know but uh, sir is really very very wonderful and professional in the operation thanks a lot sir and <laughs> i don't know how how we can thank you all so uh, great uh, how we can thank you we learned a lot of you and specifically the moderation part i have learned, learned a lot of you yeah. and this is a kind this is you know this is the essence of experience you know this is the learning from an experienced person we can have and definitely i'll i'll keep it remember and i'll i'll uh, apply to my life also if i if i've been given a chance to moderate something in the future so thank you all and thanks to my uh, met uh, teammate uh, professor swati basu without her uh, this thing cannot be successful and thanks to professor sobhosachi mukho mukhopadhyay although he is not here he has been busy with some other uh, schedule but he has been a tremendous source of inf- inspiration and acknowledgement for us thank you all and if i have uh, if i please pardon me if i forget someone's name to mention over here but i i'd like to thank all of you on behalf on behalf of bims kolkata which has been a front runner in all these kinds of webinars and uh, you know intellectual stimulations all around the years thank you thank you very much thanks a lot thank you vespar ro thank you sir thank you oh, thank you thank you let us stay in touch i think yes, it's very nice yes, and reaching uh, all the speakers in case possible thank you uh, it will thank be you. wonderful for everyone so right 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 thank you stay very safe. much thank you stay, thank stay you. safe see you again see you thank you, thank you. Yeah. and everyone is invited to bangladesh all thank lovely great right? yeah. so nice after, after the <laughs> pandemic is over oh yes thank you. Right. so nice so for you thank of you of course thank you thank stay you. safe stay safe so nice. stay safe thank you thank you thanks a lot जन गण मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा विंध्य हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उज्जल जगधि तरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाधा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे थैंक यू